Hey everyone, this is lecture number five for Remix Music, Art, and Culture. Uh, this week uh, I'm going to give a lecture on Remix as Discourse uh, and talk a little bit about your tasks for the week, uh, which includes your reading, uh, a post, and discussion as usual. Uh, assignments this week uh, for Friday by 10 p.m. Uh, you will have your post due as usual, uh, so you want to see the prompt in the week five folder. Uh, Sunday, uh, your discussion for the week is due. Uh, we had a really good job. Y'all did a really good job this week picking up discussion. I, I think we've had really uh, fruitful conversations. I've really enjoyed uh, seeing your takes on the articles. Uh, I think we're really getting to some real meat of the issues, and I'm hoping uh, the novice this week is going to help us clarify how to talk about some things, uh, or it just might muddy some things up. So we'll see what happens. Uh, Next week being uh, week six, so after this week, uh, we're going to be on the DJ Spooky, so if you haven't gotten a chance to get to get his book yet, please pick that up. Uh, you'll also have your media journal due, and that will get explained next week. Uh, the reading for this week, though, is a uh, remix theory uh, by Navas. Uh, we're reading chapter three. Uh, also, there's uh, in the, the folder for this week, uh, there should be a copy of Lev Manovich's Avocado Software. This is going to be an optional reading for the week. I originally uh, had it scheduled, but uh, the chapter from Novice is so long and complicated, uh, that will be playing for this week. But if you want to read something else, uh, Avocado Software uh, is pretty interesting. I'll bring it back to, uh, I think, week two um, and the material we talked about then. All right, so th this... Uh, in this chapter, Novice is going to get around to giving us this definition of remix. Uh, we had a preview of it uh, earlier uh, in week one uh, when we were uh, when we read the selection from the Johns Hopkins Guide to Digital Media. The shortest version of it, though, appears uh, on I think on page 126. It says uh, remix then is a discourse that helps explain activities informed by the tendencies to recombine material with a naturalized attitude. So you know, we've been throwing around the, uh, the term remix a lot, but for novice remix uh, has moved into a discourse. It's basically the way in which we talk about and understand all the kinds of repetition, recombining, cutting and pasting uh, that has become sort of natural or, or uh, common in uh, our culture today. Uh, but these he traces back to music, and so he uh, wants us to begin there. So in music, he says there are uh, three main kinds or three original kinds of remix. There's the extended, uh, which is the uh, looping version of a song that, that uh, was a second version or a B-side version that's usually longer or extends, well, uh, extends the radio version, so it's too long to play on the radio. Uh, there's the selective remix, which is going to be additive or subtractive from the original, uh, so you're going to have, yeah, th this is the kind we think of most often when we think about a, a remix. Uh, there's also the reflexive, uh, which is dependent on the original for meaning, uh, but causes reflection, reconsideration, or questioning. So this is going to be one that asks you to think back to the original, uh, one that it, the kind of remix that depends for its identity and its authority on on there being original that it's in relationship to. Uh, to that, he's going to add another one which he calls the regenerative remix. This one is a little bit more complicated and also extends out. Uh, pretty immediately from the original source of music into other areas. Uh, specifically, uh, he ties this one to uh, digital uh, digital media and, and network media, the internet, Photoshop, things like that. Uh, the best examples, he says, are software mashups, uh, things like Google News, Yahoo Pipes, uh, Ajax. Uh, there are innumerable examples. These are ones that we have names for, but basically anytime you have one selection of software or one selection of code that's been uh, combined with another selection of code for another purpose to create a, a third purpose. Now, Ajax, for example, being a mashup of uh, Java programming language or JavaScript program programming language and uh, XML programming language. And these are two completely separate things that you jam together to create other stuff. Uh, so he says what defines a regenerative remix uh, is that it doesn't depend on the authority of what it samples. It instead gains its authority from functionality. So uh, it doesn't matter what gets combined so much as what you can do with it when it comes out. Uh, now this can be a, have a uh, reflexive function, kind of like the reflexive remix we talked about here. And so it causes you to think back on the original. 
uh, but the uh, reflexive regenerative remix or the reflexive mashup or in software terms is really only a practical awareness of the sources. It doesn't cause you to reflect critically on the sources. So uh, it may be important for uh, Google News, uh, for an understanding of Google News, to know what sources it's sampling from. Uh, but it doesn't ask you to critically reflect on them or, th or think about them in type any type of critical way. It's just important that you know that this story comes from the Miami Herald as opposed to uh, the uh, Times-Picayune or whatever. So again, there is a kind of reflexive uh, software mashup uh, where it's important to sort of be practically aware of what's been mashed together, but that's, it doesn't require uh, critical reflection or questioning. That's, uh, that's the distinction. Uh, the regenerative, regenerative remix also uh, usually uh, depends on constant updating rather than on sampling. Uh, so think of the blog or Google News or Twitter, for example, that, that really depend on a constant stream of always updating uh, uh, content, always new content, as opposed to samples that sort of stay more or less static. So the thing that Nava says that, that's uh, particularly noteworthy about the regenerative remix is that it's open to a historicity. It's possible to be sampling things and updating things so frequently that there is no connection to original context or original content. Uh, it's there in a flash and then gone. In this sense, he argues that uh, the regenerative remix isn't a truly a remix, but instead embodies remix principles the cutting, uh, sampling, and so on, uh, but extended into other remix practices. And here's where this discussion of allegory and remix comes in. And for an allegory, uh, the meaning or value of, the, of what you're, uh, of the cultural object you're interacting with, depends on your ability to see through it, to see history behind it, to basically recognize the history that's uh, associated with it. Uh, and so, uh, when Owens, the person he's quoting, uh, now is quoting, says that all postmodern culture is allegorical, it's an understanding of these kind of spliced together, fragmented, uh, fragments of culture coming together as being a kind of collage of histories, right? It's, a, it's combining of all sorts of histories. So now says that most types of remix have their power in, in what he calls the spectacular aura of the, the samples that brings together. Spectacular in a sense that it's not necessarily functional in any way, it's just sort of, you know, pleasurable or desirable by the people who are consuming it. Uh, and the aura, bringing back to Benjamin, the situatedness in uh, time space and, and its historicity. Uh, so basically, uh, a lot of remixes function through uh, giving you something from the past that you recognize that you find really pleasurable. And he's really going to double down this idea that, that remix is defined by this trace of history. He's going to say, say it in multiple places. So uh, here's one on page 67, the material must be recognized, otherwise it could be misunderstood as something new uh, and it would become plagiarism. However, when this happens, it would not mean that the material reproduced, the material produced does not have any principles of remix at play, only that the author has framed the content, the author had framed the content goes against an ethical code placed on culture and intellectual property. Regardless of legal contentions without a trace of the history, it cannot, the remix cannot be remixed. Uh, so this he, he'll come back to again and again that the remix is defined by a remixing that you have to recognize that it's a a return to something that existed before otherwise it's not a remix also again he's emphasizing that it doesn't mean that there aren't remix principles it just means that the ethic the ethical code has been disregarded so here again uh, on 118 in this regard history is crucial to the notion of remixing the work itself exposes a dependency on a pre-existing context and content, as noted above when remix was defined. Uh, without a recognized history to support it, the remix cannot be remix, instead becomes plagiarism and an injustice to history as well as the law. However, the object can still be evaluated for principles of selectivity, reflexivity as found in remix, uh, are at play. Uh, so again, to be remix, it has to have history connected to it. It has to be allegorical. It has to have a trace uh, of the original that it's working from. I know this has come up on the forums a couple times. Uh, the forums, I mean on Google Google Plus, uh, a couple times uh, with regard to some of the remixes that we were looking at or some of the articles we were looking at. But again here, uh, novices 
doubling down on this idea that Remix has to have this trace of history or else it's Remix practices put to some other ends. And why does he think this is so important? Uh, that comes up more or less through his discussion of whether or not Remix has ever uh, been a form of resistance or whether it's ever capable of resistance. Uh, he's going to cite three cultural uh, cultural scholars or cultural studies scholars uh, to raise a question about uh, why Remix would <laughs> uh, perhaps not be uh, a form of uh, progressive cultural practice. Uh, the first is uh, Frederick Jameson and talking about the waning of affect. Uh, each of these is is kind of complicated, so I'm just going to narrow it down to a real a distilled point uh, to try to uh, remember what they're saying. Right. So Jameson talking about the waning of affect uh, argues essentially that in contemporary culture and postmodern culture. Uh, all we ever get are images of images uh, rather than getting representations. So uh, he compares uh, Van Gogh's uh, Van Gogh's shoes, uh, in which you have uh, you know the elaborate brush strokes and the careful detailing, and you can see the hand of the author, and it's representative of well the uh, uh, representative of the working class. As compared to Warhol's, which is a mass, who uses a mass reproductive method to show mass reproduced shoes, which is sort of detached from any type of real connection to uh, the world people. It's just an image of an image. And we can see how that applies to Remix, uh, obviously, because Remix is uh, not new representation, but it's a recutting together of things that were already produced. Uh, Atali is going to talk about. Uh, the transition from mute, from noise into music and argue that the move to recordings is a uh, move away from performance or recording supplanting performance and with that repetition is going to supplant representation. Uh, as a result people were able to, it, for example, download their favorite songs, listen to them over and over again uh, and produces this sort of infinite pleasure in the reconsumption of uh, established culture. Uh, and this is a way to sort of you know, neutralize resistance and violence and make people complacent and, and happy with the, the established norms. Uh, these principles really draw on uh, Adorno uh, and his concept of the culture industry. Uh, and he talks about the uh, regressive listener or the passive listener uh, who says that they want to hear something new, but really not have their uh, beliefs or tastes challenged in any way. So, in other words, they want a remix of what's already understood. So, how does this apply to uh, remix specifically? Uh, so, the waning of affect means that a remix can't really engage with real experience. It's only ever reproducing more images. It stays kind of on a surface level, uh, detached from detached from real experience of history. Atali is going to make uh, basically make the case that the DJs have been instrumental in solidifying and repeating culture because they take pre-recorded material and put them into replay and circulation on the internet, uh, well, not on, <laughs> well now on the internet, but uh, we used to be on the radio, right, to sort of mass broadcast a reproduction of culture which reproduces desire and, and so on. Finally, Adorno is going, Adorno applied to remix means that uh, you have the same culture that's represented as something new, you get the same music that's already been established, music that's already been accepted or comforting and so on, it's just represented as something new, but it's basically the same. One of the examples he uses, or one of the, the prime examples of a uh, remix that, that doesn't really have a potential for resistance, is what is, is the regressive mashup. So with the regressive mashup, uh, you get a kind of reflexive remix is, is pointing back to the original, but doesn't require any type of questioning. It's usually super super popular songs, or like a mega mix from an era, where you have uh, uh, short samples of everything that came out in 1982 or something like that. One example that's kind of current would be when Jimmy Fallon does a history of hip hop uh, with uh, Justin Timberlake. Uh, that'd be an excellent example of a, re a regressive mashup. Uh, it's pointing back to uh, the original songs, but doesn't ask you to, rec to question them in any way or think about them critically in any type of way. So uh, as Nava says in 96, they point back to the greatness of the original track by celebrating it uh, with, with a remix or as a remix. 
um, and they never leave this specular, spectacular realm. It's just sort of exciting and pleasurable to be re-experiencing culture again. So, but novice is going to make the argument that uh, Remix does have a uh, progressive or uh, a kind of potential for resistance even after he heaps up this big argument for why it isn't. And in fact, he's going to admit that Remix is often put to regressive uh, to regressive ends. Again, very quickly in just samples here, radio and the repetition that it depends on was able to bring exposure and voice to black music uh, artists and, and culture uh, because that was you know, really how they came out, uh, really how it came and was brought to uh, uh, mass culture in that way through the repetition of recorded performances. Uh, then eventually in the 70s and 80s, hip hop and turntablism repurposed a turntable uh, as a kind of instrument. Remixing became a kind of art and performance itself, innovative collage of repetitions. Uh, so this meant it was possible to claim agency and identity and autonomy through manipulation of repetitions, although it gets kind of complicated uh, also. It kind of depends, on again, on a case-by-case -case basis. And you get the sense at this point that that's going to be true of, of pretty much all of his examples, that it really depends on the individual application of these principles, uh, how it, uh, <laughs> which direction the remix is going to go. For example, uh, he cautions that interactivity, uh, which was so central to uh, the way that uh, hip hop and turntablism became a kind of resistance to uh, repetition, uh, the ideology of repetition, doesn't always equal resistance. So there's a kind of interactivity in the way that websites elicit your interaction, manipulating DVD feedback, uh, DVD extras, playing video games, making personal playlists on Pandora, Spotify. All of these are examples of a kind of interactivity you're DJing, right? And you know, the people, and as he says on 111, uh, yet the people who participate in any of these activities, more often than not, are not necessarily critical, but simply consume via an, an assimilated form of interactivity which the end is regressive, not reflexive. In other words, culture has uh, become kind of an interactive, or uh, mass culture has kind of become a, and expects a kind of interactivity. And so merely selecting the songs that you like in your play playlist is not a critical activity. That's just what it, how, the form of culture these days. All of these examples, uh, he says, demand that the user be aware of a sophisticated state of appropriation. So how is resistance possible? Uh, and it really comes down to these few examples. I've tried to distill this from uh, a really broad ranging uh, article. Uh, and what it basically comes down to is a kind of difference in the repetition. Uh, and the important thing to recognize is that context changes everything. So each time you repeat something, it always occurs in the context in which the original has already taken place. His examples are like Sherry, Sherry Levine's uh, re-photographing. Uh, she's done multiple photographers, the Walker Evans, for example. When you encounter Sherry Levine's uh, re-photograph or after Walker Evans, uh, you will always see them in the context of the original Walker Evans. So even though they look identical, uh, they are different because they are acknowledging or pointing back to a past in which the Walker Evans already took place. Uh, so this is why it's so important for him to acknowledge the original when you make the remix. So, because when you do that citation, it both acknowledges the history, so it, it retains the value of the history, while affirming the present, that this is something new, this is a new iteration, a re-presentation that uh, brings the old or the history into a reconsideration in the present, uh, thereby recontextualizing both. So and that ends up being the real power of uh, the remix, is being able to take samples from the past, samplings of the past, and then bring them into a recontextualized present so we can think about that past as it's been brought into the present, or think about uh, the constellation of uh, previous uh, media and what they what they the cultures they connect to, the meanings that they were imbued with at the time, and how they've been made meaningful, or how they're meaningful in this new context of the present. Uh, however, if you don't cite the past, if you don't acknowledge that these are samples, or where these samples come from, uh, that connection with the past can be lost. Uh, and he says, and then it starts looking like plagiarism, or it starts looking 
uh, like a, it can be misunderstood as, as an original, and then you lose this dialogue between the present and past that's possible in Remix. So this week, uh, I'm asking you to find an example of what novice is saying these these uh, remix practices that sort of move that have moved beyond the realm of music. Uh, so this week, novice explains that remix isn't just a style of music, but is a discourse through which we understand the variety of repetitions that characterize contemporary culture. And he has lots of different examples, from T-shirts with uh, McDonald's logos on them to a mailbox that was painted to look like. Uh, C-3PO, uh, things like that. He's got lots of different examples, with all sorts of software mashups and so on. Uh, so uh, as a result, uh, the concepts, principles, and practices of Remix can be found in all manner of places from Las Vegas to Google News. So your task this week is to find an example of non-music cultural object practice or phenomenon that exhibits Remix principles and explain it using the terminology the novice provides. So if Remix is really a discourse through which we understand the kinds of repetitions, samplings, cut and pastings uh, that, that sort of characterize our contemporary culture, uh, then we should be able to apply it to those types of things. Uh, so that's your task this week. Uh, find some non-musical example of Remix and talk about it in, in basically the way that Novice does using his kinds of categories and, and, and principles and definitions. Uh, hopefully through this lecture I've been able to give you uh, some signposts and uh, principles to look for ways in, uh, the, some uh, aspects of the remix that are important to highlight and respond to and look for. Uh, Novice is going to give you an awful lot too. I, I didn't feel like I was valuable to to walk through each of those. Uh, but if you have any uh, further questions about uh, what Novice is talking about or any of these uh, uh, key points for identifying a progressive remix or anything else I've talked about, please post some on Google Plus uh, so I can respond to you and we can get a, a discussion going in class or what, what is functioning for us as class is Google Plus. So again this week uh, you just have the reading which is uh, Novice Chapter 3, uh, the optional reading of the Lev Manovich piece. Uh, you have your post this week, which is due on Friday, which again is to find a non-music example of Remix and apply uh, in key points from, no from the novice's discussion to it. And then finally, contribute your uh, 300 words or more uh, to discussion. Again, there's an awful lot of material this week, uh, and I wasn't. A I, this would be a huge video if I tried to address all of it. Uh, so I hope to hit some consolation points that uh, I hope will make it a little bit more meaningful or, or at least help you focus when you're reading this week. Um, but again, if you have any questions about what's going on, this is this is a lot of material this week, so please do bring them up on Google+. Other than that, uh, I look forward to seeing you on the forums. Uh, have a great week, and I'll see you next week.